Great. Well, uh, you know, uh, uh, as we've said a number of times today, a big theme of this is, is really about having the right people in the room. And uh, we're very fortunate today to have with us Paul Vixie. Uh, Paul is, uh, certainly qualifies on the, on the internet legend scale. Uh, he uh, helped uh, craft a lot of what we use today in DNS. He's in the Internet Hall of Fame. Uh, he was one of the creators of Maps, one of the first spam fighting blacklists uh, that um, you know really helped um, you know protect a lot of us and, and, and kind of set the ground ground rules for that. Uh, and he's here to talk to us today about the public health crisis on, on the internet, uh, which I'm sure will be I'm sure will be a great talk. So we're really fortunate to have him with us here today, and I'm going to hand it off to Paul. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I have been around the uh, world a couple of times recently giving a talk based on this general theme, uh, this public health crisis. And um, you know, it's, it can be a little bit scary or it can be a little bit fun depending on the audience. Um, I, I will say that uh, I, the email industry has come a huge way uh, to have a room full of people who have not sued me. Um, this is cool, so uh, thank you all for, uh, for that. Um, so, I prepare this talk and I update it and uh, the biggest challenge is always to find something uh, new to say. In other words, what is the, a problem that we're having now that we have not been having for such a long time that we ought to be embarrassed by that long time um, so this was a June update. I could have updated it today, but it would have been just different PIDs and IP addresses. Uh, what you're seeing here has been in all of your syslogs and all of my syslogs for the last 15 years. Uh, this is a whole bunch of people out there on the internet who are scanning the IPv4 address space looking for open TCP 22 servers. When they find one, they start guessing root passwords. Uh, Amazingly, they, uh, they succeed, right? They're not just doing this out of desperation. Uh, I once created a VM somewhere and left the password as, uh, the root password as ABC123 and found myself part of a Linux botnet with a, within 24 hours. Um, so what's interesting about the internet economy, uh, for those of you who maybe uh, grew up after all of this started taking place, is that we have just, we take this for granted. It's like, yes, there's a huge amount of crap coming at everybody all the time, and you better defend yourself. Um, when the internet started, it was a academic network for the most part. It was tended to be government funded, and it was full of people that you could trust not to do stuff like this. Uh, I, I will guarantee you that in 1989, if I had seen something like this in my syslog, I would have known who to call would have called somebody and some student would have been thrown out of some school and that would have been the end of it. Uh, we don't live that way now. Uh, the way we live right now is that pretty much everybody is doing everything they can to everybody all the time. Um, so the difficulty that poses is that the internet is not a research toy anymore. It is the global backbone. If, if humanity had a nervous system, it would be the internet. Uh, it's what global culture uses for uh, you know, communication with itself, and also global commerce. Um, so let me talk some about the implications of this. In uh, 2002, I wrote these words, and um, 10 years later, October 2012, uh, we got together, the ICANN Security and Stability Advisory Committee, and uh, toasted the fact that it had been 10 years since this was published and that the problem it described uh, had gotten worse, only worse, no, never better, nowhere better. Um, and this got a fair amount of play. We talked to governments, we talked to corporations, we talked to sort of uh, insurance collectives. We, we really tried to explain that source address validation was important and if you just allow anything you want into the edge of, it, of the network anywhere, uh, then all hell's gonna break loose, and it does, and we just live with it. Um, this is what that looks like. If you haven't heard my source address validation talk, uh, it goes something like this. There is an attacker at the top. Uh, there is a victim on the left, yes, your left, and there is some fat, dumb, happy DNS server, probably you know, at the bottom, called, which I've labeled the reflector here, 
And it turns out that the internet has no admission control on almost uh, on most of, of its edge. So that attacker is able to source a stream of requests uh, that all say that they came from the target, right? They're forged, uh, and send those to the reflector who then answers them. Because by the time you go in and out of that big internet cloud thing in the middle, you can't tell where it should have come from. It's only one, only two parties really in this uh, picture who can tell, who, who can put a stop to this. One is the attacker, if they would just stop, but of course they have motives, so they're not going to. And the other is their ISP. Uh, the ISP knows what source addresses should be coming out of their network, because after all, those are the addresses they're using. Those are the addresses they are advertising to their upstream. And uh, they could turn on some fairly trivial options in their edge equipment in order to drop these packets. Uh, because that's the only place in this topology where you can be sure they're wrong. Um, they won't. There are reasons for that. Uh, there's not an incentive for upfront security engineering. Uh, for example, that ISP I mentioned a moment ago would have had to uh, train their people differently in terms of setting up new customers, installing new CMTSs, whatever it is. There'd be a slightly different configuration mix um, for initial setup, it would also be a different break-fix flowchart. If something's not working, this is one more thing you got to look at. Did somebody make a typographical error on this filtering? So that, that level of training, that level of investment, monitoring and so forth, um, if, it's, if the only impact is going to be that your competitors have a better life because your customers are no longer able to spam them with packets that didn't come from them, uh, it's hard to explain to your board of directors, I wish to make an investment here locally, increase our costs, but it will not increase our revenue. Uh, it will, however, decrease our competitors' costs. Uh, I don't know how many of you have gone to your boss with that story, but when I do it, it doesn't end well. Um, so there's also not a lot of incentive to monitor the output of your own network. Uh, certainly, a lot of ISPs learned early on that spam was a drug and that they needed to start thinking seriously about rate limiting TCP 25 traffic, but that was only because of the complaints they got from the outside. Uh, and those complaints is uh, using external complaints as a motivator for local investment is very much pushing on a rope. It's, it's unsatisfying. Uh, there's not a lot of incentive to share actionable telemetry with your competitors. Uh, you know, it, it may be that uh, some criminal gang is uh, controlling a botnet using command and control nodes across several different ISPs, several different banks usually, uh, and if they could just share information, then they would have enough detail to maybe get law enforcement involved, maybe get some prison time involved, uh, but they don't. Uh, that's not the business they're in. That's not going to increase their revenue. That's not going to give them a better quarter. It doesn't change their stock price. Uh, those are the needles we need to move if we want people to act to behave differently. So I call this the chemical polluter business model, uh, pioneered uh, during the Industrial Revolution where you put a factory on the side of a river. Uh, it depends on fresh water for its production. It outputs some very non-fresh water uh, that goes back into the river. And as long as all the profit occurs here and all the damage occurs downstream, uh, then the only thing that will incent you to alter your business model would be regulation. Uh, we, who have been in the internet economy for a while, think of regulation as a bad thing. It's, it's the reason the internet has been able to grow so well and that innovation has been so effective is that we don't have a lot of bureaucrats telling us what we can't do. Um, so I raise this point because if regulation is the only way to stop this, and we, uh, the only certain way to stop it, and we don't innovate and find some other way to stop it, we're essentially inviting the bureaucrats to come regulate us. So if you think this is not your problem, then try to imagine the, pro the other problems that you're going to have if you don't change your mind about this being your problem. By the way, I don't know who controls this clock, but it's not ticking anymore. So um, here's a hopeful sign. I used to work at Internet Systems Consortium. Uh, you would have heard of us if you run a piece of software called BIND, B-I-N-D, the Berkeley Internet Name Demon. Um, I was the BIND maintainer for about 12 years, and a lot of the bugs and certainly all of the current config file syntax is my fault. Uh, so I apologize for that. I was learning as I went. But um, 
we noticed that our name servers were often used in that bottom box. We were being used as a reflector. Uh, in fact, not just a reflector, but an amplifying reflector because DNSSEC makes everything bigger. You get a tiny little 50 byte query and you answer with two or 3,000, maybe 4,000 bytes of uh, digital signatures and so forth. And so uh, your incentive, if you're running a content server uh, with or without DNSSEC is to make it very powerful. Because if you get DDoSed, you want to still be on the net. So there you are buying blade after blade, sticking them behind load balancers, buying multiple transits, getting all kinds of just massive power so that people can use you as a DDoS reflector. At least that's the way the bad guys see it. So we thought there's got to be something we can do, uh, and there was, uh, to guess. And in this case, what, uh, what we did is we guessed that if the same target network or the same, same network uh, sent us a lot of different queries uh, where the answer was substantially similar, we kept saying the same thing to them over and over again, uh, and they said more than, let's say, 10 per second, that that was maybe a signal that number 11 and above could be dropped safely because it was probably a DDoS. Now, we don't just drop them. There's other stuff we have to do. We have to send back a certain number of truncation indications and so forth. So there are details there on the web. You can find them or talk to me uh, at the next break if I'm here. Uh, but the point is we wanted to make those reflectors at the bottom uh, less useful to bad guys. And here is an example of what happened when Affilius turned on our patch. So you see a zero line here uh, where the negative material very, very close to the bottom of this graph represents input. Those are queries coming into a .info name server. Uh, so it's a TLD name server, and it's what I said. It's massively powerful, a lot of blades, load balancers, you know, huge power bill. Uh, and they were paying a huge transit bill. These peaks, in case you can't read them from there, go up above two gigabits per second. And uh, if you're paying by the bit, that's a fairly expensive transmit to be doing. Uh, so, on the one hand, people were calling them and complaining, why are you sending me so many responses? And Affilius would say, well, because you're sending us all these queries. Or, no, I'm not. Well, how can I tell they're not from you? Well, I'm not sending them. Well, do you want me to just black hole you? Because then you wouldn't be able to look up any .info names and so forth. That's how it would go. But when the accountant got the bill for this transit thing, then it became a very different uh, value proposition for solving it. So what you'll see here is that on Thursday, they installed our patch and the input continued unabated, but the output went down below 100 megabits a second. Total number of complaints, zero. We're very proud. This was free software, um, the free algorithms. We put everything out with the BSD license. We got the NSD people to use it also, so it's not just in bind now. In fact, the Kanot people, K-N-O-T, it's from uh, the CZ Nick people in Prague, also implements this. It is really cool stuff. And so the first thing I want to tell you is if you're running a DNS content server, it doesn't have to be a TLD server, any kind of content server, please turn on rate limiting. You will be doing the rest of the world a favor, and you might even save yourself some money because they will eventually find you. If you don't turn this on, they will find out that you haven't turned it on, and you will be used as a DDoS reflector. Every time you read in the paper that uh, Spam House or Cloudflare or somebody has been hit with a 400 gigabit attack, it's this. It's, it's this exact mechanism, so please don't participate. Okay, so we are all counting. Everybody in this room who has an internet-related business is counting on the tech consumer to continue to buy our stuff and to want the next thing that we invent. Uh, but it isn't just us. Security companies are counting on those people to buy security products to protect themselves. Criminals are counting on those people because that's the money they're trying to steal. In other words, everybody in the internet economy is counting on the tech consumer. So what does the tech consumer want? Uh, the tech consumer just wants the next shiny object. And uh, they might be price sensitive, but they're certainly not going to be quality sensitive. If you think about all the, the amazing junk that goes over the counter at Fry's Electronics that people just plug in. Um, and that poses a real problem because that, that's what you would call an open loop, right? It's, it, this, there's, there's no closed loop control there. Uh, you can just get more and more and faster and faster, and in this case, worse and worse. Um, I'm trying to demonstrate with this graph, this is the, the way sound synthesizers think, uh, that there is a product lifetime. Uh, so if you think about area under this curve as revenue, 
You think of attack as the period of time it takes you to innovate a new product. Uh, so you want the slope of that attack to be as fast as possible. Uh, very little time capping to the highest possible revenue. Um, decay is how often it takes your first competitor to equal whatever you've done. Sustain is how long it takes uh, somebody in China or India or somebody else to equal what you've done. And then release is uh, how long it takes some other innovator to completely replace what you've done. Um, the only thing that is in your power, if you were following along, is that attack curve. So time to market is your only knob on the area under the curve when it comes to the, the total lifetime product revenue, um, which means quality is not on your list of things to worry about. So there you are trying to get your margins down, get your product lifetime long, and get your TTM short, and therefore your volume up. The tech consumer might care about cost, they probably care about features. I don't see anybody so far that I've listed who cares about quality or safety. And as a result, if you look at Windows, Mac OS, Android, Java, ActiveX, I'm, I'm not picking on anybody, I, don't, I, I hate them all, because every one of them, <laughs> Every one of them is trying to optimize area under the curve because that's how we win, right? If you're a capitalist and you don't behave this way, then your assets will be bought out of bankruptcy by somebody who did. It's not like you have a lot of choice. So we're producing junk. We're producing worse junk faster as a result of the ability to communicate with each other and we're delivering it more widely. Um, this does not currently sound like a closed loop control system that could eventually stop oscillating and reach some kind of equilibrium. It seems like it's gonna get worse and worse until something breaks. Here's Configure, it broke. This was a bug that had been in Microsoft software for a while and um, was not exploited until the patch came out. In other words, it was not discovered by a bad guy and was a zero day that we all had to panic about. This was just a normal patch. Somebody reported a bug, Microsoft fixed it, and so forth. And as soon as that patch came out, some bad guy somewhere reverse engineered it and figured out, ooh, it's a buffer overrun and thus and so service, and I can connect to that and send a really long string, and then the extra bytes will go into the stack and we'll execute them, and you know, the really smart people that are working on this. I could never have figured that out. Uh, Stack-oriented programming, return-oriented programming, they call it now. Uh, it's amazing stuff. I'm still running the Configur sinkhole. My company uh, runs that as a public service, and the telemetry is available to anybody for, for no fee. Um, and so I can tell you that the peak in 2009 was 11 million unique IPs per day. And today, this day, while I'm sitting here in this chair, we are building up 1 million unique IPs six years later, six years after this bug was found. One of the big reasons for that is that the first thing Configure did after it got into your computer is turn off anything that would update any of your software. It turned off all your AV, turned off your Windows update. So I have a uh, perfect inventory updated daily of a million unique IPs out there that, are, that have not had any patches to any zero days that have been announced since 2008. And that's quite an inventory of other ways I could get into all those computers. So you should be worried about the fact that I don't control the distribution of that list, right? If somebody comes to me and says that they want to work on remediation, can I give them the list? It's like, how do I know they shouldn't have it? Um, but that's, <laughs> this, this was a success story compared to some other botnets that have come through in the last 10 years. Um, and we did have one fa fascinating example, one of our guys just got pissed off and he said, I don't care if there's 11 million of them, I'm gonna call them and because uh, nobody was doing anything, so we figured he would do something. And so on his third day of uh, all coffee, no sleep, he, he, he reaches a hospital somewhere in the Atlanta metro area who says, uh, yeah, we know about that. You know, you call, you go through the phone tree, you talk to the IT guy, you say, this is the IP address, it's infected with Configure, and the guy says, yeah, I know about that. It is a portable x-ray machine in an operating theater, and it is subject to federal law, and we can't upgrade the software, that's not one of our options. Well, could you at least take it off the net? Nope, can't do that. It needs to be able to exchange whatever data with whatever. Well, could you at least put a firewall around it? Well, no, we don't have a budget for that. So um, I don't know how many of these million things are set up in a way that if we patched them, they might like kill people. Um, <laughs> but 
I will say that I, I'm not happy that it was natural consequences. It's how we built our information economy that led to this situation. Uh, so it's not just a, an unstable equilibrium, it's a really, it's one we would never have accepted if we'd been told in 1990, let's say four, we wanna commercialize and privatize the internet and make it way bigger so that we can have this outcome, we would have said that's a bad deal for us. That deal was not offered, it came to us one day at a time. Heartbleed was this year's excitement. Again, this was a bug that was in plain sight for several years and it was not exploited until after the public disclosure, right? The patch came out and then people started uh, beating on it. Um, so I, since this was open source software, the Microsoft example was not open source. This is open source and I'm wondering, does this mean that we now have so much open source software that there is too much of it for everybody to review? Because the, the old claim, and I've made this claim, was uh, open source software has a chance for somebody to go look for bugs in it in a way that proprietary software doesn't, therefore it's safer. And that was probably much more true in 1988 when we were talking about, you know, BSD and early versions of Apache and, and things like that. Not Apache really, but, uh, you know, the various small bits of software written by university students getting reviewed by other university students. That was practical, but, you know, we've got billions of lines of source code sitting in plain sight with bugs like this. And uh, it's no longer getting caught by security companies hoping to make headlines for themselves and increase their stock price. It's being, uh, it's just sitting there until the zero day comes. Or, and then we get to this, uh, this public disclosure was phased. I'm not saying these people were irresponsible. They didn't just throw the bug over the wall and let everybody patch when they got around to it. They talked to, uh, Apple, they talked to Microsoft, they talked to the Apache Software Foundation, everybody who had an SSL dependency in their product got a phone call, got email, they got talked to by certs and so forth, and it was still a fiasco. And so the idea of doing phased disclosure may also have been overrun by growth, uh, just as op the safety of open source software may have been overrun by growth. Uh, and I think at this point, throwing it over the wall may have been equally effective to the fiasco we got when Heartbleed was announced. Um, we learned that X509 revocation doesn't work, shouldn't be done, couldn't work if it was tried, and would melt the DNS if it was tried, because you actually have to do a DNS lookup to look for a revocation certificate for every key that you touch. And if every one of your web browsers were doing that right now, then we'd have people coming in from the hallways asking what was going wrong in here because we were melting their network, right? And that's just us. So this was amazingly crazy to come up with a global CA system based on something that uh, nobody was ever gonna do and if they had, it would have been like explosive decompression. Um, but again, that's, those are the natural properties of the information revolution. We, we live in the information age and this is why it's working and why it's hurting. Uh, finally, let me say that uh, Heartbleed was not necessarily present in the HP ILOM, uh, right? It didn't have the bug, it wasn't based on OpenSSL. However, scanning your network, if it included a whole bunch of HP ILOMs, would reboot all the servers that had those uh, ILOMs. The scan that you would do to check for the vulnerability was fatal to the HP ILOM. Um, so if you think you're gonna get away from this by red teaming yourself, then you know, make sure that you've got uh, high availability on all the services you're testing. Because apparently the QA budget on that ILOM did not include red teaming it against this type of scanning, which is something I at least would have thought to do. Um, so Eisenberg told us, and he was right, uh, he was talking about the um, Intelligent Network, which is something the phone company was trying to build. He was inside Bell Labs when he wrote this. Uh, the Intelligent Network uh, is crazy. We can't put intelligence in the network. We have to have a stupid core with a smart edge. Um, and he's right. It, you know, unless you thought that ISDN was gonna be the right way to build the web, uh, then you really are standing on top of a stupid network with a smart edge where your computer has a lot of state in it, but the network it's attached to doesn't have flow state, doesn't have any kind of uh, connection direction or anything else. Uh, that's the only way we could have built a network as large as this. Um, however, 
we have not only a stupid core, but a stupid edge, and that's not what he told us to build. Uh, we need a smart edge. Um, unfortunately, the more intelligence we put in the edge, the more complexity we have in the edge. And errors follow complexity like night follows day. So uh, the fact that we can't even get it right when we spend a billion dollars on QA before shipping something to Mars and we still have to send patches through uh, interplanetary space should tell you that writing bug-free software is something that you probably don't want to design in. You know, that's an assumption you probably don't want to say, oh, and we'll just make sure there are no bugs before it goes out. <laughs> what you need is an assumption, there are going to be bugs, what are we going to do about them? I mentioned IP packets can be sent by anybody claiming to be from anybody. You in the email industry certainly know that's true of email. Um, SPF's a great idea, DKIM's a great idea, but they are not solving the problem. Uh, bad guys can get those keys too. They so it might make it hard to forge somebody's specifics address, but the ability to send an address that has no accountability and gives someone no recourse in, in terms of finding you is still present. Um, we're starting to see a growth in password managers, which is interesting because my wife and I share some passwords for like the, the logins to our banks and whatnot. So one of us will change a password and then the other guy's uh, password manager will be wrong until we go get that fixed up. So I think we're gonna reinvent Kerberos badly before we get done with the password manager uh, management uh, industry. Uh, BGP, does anybody here speak BGP? Do we have any router engineers here? Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll skip this part. I'm at zero seconds, so at some point I'm gonna get the hook, so. Um, You want? Let me let me let me continue. And, uh, so, if you know that you're going to be selling millions of dollars worth of a product, then you might be willing to spend tens of thousands of dollars on QA in that product. But if you're building it and you're not sure what the market's going to be, uh, you're probably not going to spend a great deal of time on QA before first ship. And often, by the time you've completed first ship, it's too late to patch that. I heard about uh, somebody had a, um, uh, it was a device that was in some uh, phone or whatever that uh, the device driver maker uh, was actually the chip maker. And there was a clone of that chip. And they were trying to, to cut down the market on the clone for that chip. So they bricked all the devices that contained the clone. Uh, by using a device driver update. What they didn't know is that their own supply chain had been inf infiltrated by the clone maker and a whole bunch of their own customers then went off net. Um, so I, I would like people to spend more time thinking, what if we succeed? What if there's a gigantic market? Well, we could end up with an infected supply chain, for example. Um, however, uh, marketing and sales beats quality every time, right? You just Look at uh, how many more Mac laptops we have than Debian Linux laptops and ask anybody who knows the quality of the innards of them and they'll tell you, yes, sales and marketing will beat the quality of the device uh, every day of the week. Um, and so any company can come up with a shiny object that these users are clamoring for. They want more shiny objects and uh, make a bundle. So why does this hurt them? Unfortunately, it doesn't hurt the maker. It hurts the overall economy. Um, finally, spend a minute on this, Van Jacobson uh, came up with this drawing, which is a wonderful way to show what happens on a wireless network. If you have a 50 megabit per second or 100 megabit per second wireless network connected over a 5 megabit DSL, then you might send a lot of packets, but only a few of them are going to make it to the other side. And look how long and squishy they are when they're in the thin part of the network. Okay, so what does this mean to us? It means that every one of our devices has to have plenty of buffering, right? We're sending files and we're receiving vo voice over IP calls and so forth. And you have to carefully time what you send in order to not overrun any of those thin parts of the path between you and the other end. And uh, we all get it wrong. And, and so the wireless gateway here is probably the, the finest piece of wireless gateway that Microsoft can afford to buy, and they've got a lot of money. So I'm sure it's really good equipment. I can't see it, but I'm sure that it's really good, but I'm also sure it has this problem. You'd like it to be that with 200 of us using this wireless network, we would each get one 200th of the bandwidth. If we were all 
trying to transfer files at the same speed and so forth. Uh, that's not what happens. What happens is that device buffers the hell out of everything that we're all doing because it has mindlessly doubled the amount of buffer memory it's had year over year over year without any kind of queue management. And this means that TCP guesses fatally wrong as to the width and placement of that skinny place. And we each end up with one four hundred thousandth or forty thousandth, one forty thousandth. Uh, that's congestion collapse. Uh, and it's because there's too much buffering. It's not that the algorithms are bad, it's that there's too much buffering. And we did that without a plan, as near as I can tell. I hope nobody did this on purpose. And the only way we're gonna fix it, by the way, is to, to pretty much replace the installed base. This particular wireless gateway, I'll bet, is field upgradable, but the ones you have at your house are probably not. WRT54G and so forth. You, you can, you can root it and uh, update it yourself if you're really smart, but your parents probably can't. They would have to go buy a new one. And chances are they won't. Okay, so um, TCP is really deep stuff. Um, and all I want to tell you is that when you send a TCP SYN packet, in other words, you're trying to open a connection somewhere, uh, the person you send it to is going to send you a SYNAC, and each of those has a sequence number. And if you don't get a SYNAC, like uh, let's say you forge the address, uh, then you're going to send another SYN because the SYNAC went to the forged address. Furthermore, if the guy who is sending the SYNAC does not get a reset or a fin or something else, he's going to send the SYNAC again. And that means that every TCP listener and that's every one of the devices I see in this room, um, having at least 10, maybe 30 TCP listeners, is capable of being a DDoS amplifier because the TCP protocol that we built the internet economy on has this property. We should not, in my opinion, be retransmitting things before we're sure that the addresses weren't spoofed. But that, when we were designing this, it was a bunch of trusted university people who had government contracts just like we had, and we said, yeah, there's not going to be any spoofing, you know, uh, th this is a safe thing to do. So, um, I have recommendations. The nation state backed attackers that are taking advantage of this have got to be stopped. And that's going to require treaty action and maybe even cutting some transatlantic cables because this is now a major source of uh, tr wealth transfer from productive countries to unproductive countries. Uh, we're not going to solve it here. Corporate private police force is not the way to solve a nation state problem, never has been. Um, we've got to increase the compliance burden on these device manufacturers. If they are shipping crap, then something bad should happen to them, like liability for the bad things that happen from their devices. Um, we need the, some compliance burden on these ISPs. If you're allowing raw sewage to come out of your network, having the wrong source address, so you're a place where DDoSes can be launched from, uh, you should not be able to buy certain types of insurance, and then you should be forced out of business because that kind of insurance should be required for your lease or something like that. And finally, Dan Gear, who is brilliant and wonderful to, uh, to, to listen to, you should Google his um, DEF CON talk. He gave a, just a hugely wonderful keynote at DEF CON. Uh, and he suggested that if you are producing a device that can't be field upgraded, can't be patched, then it should expire. It should have a date beyond which it no longer functions because we already know it's got bugs. The law of large numbers tells us it has bugs. We just don't know what they are yet. So we should just pick some estimate, like two or three years, after which it doesn't function. Manufacturers should love this because it will make people come back and buy the next version. So this shouldn't be a hard <laughs> sell. But if we don't do that, we're going to continue explosively growing the attack surface for the rest of our careers, which will be good for me. I'm in the security business, but it's not good for everybody. Any questions? So we, uh, we're going to wrap it up without any questions. This way we oh. get to uh, chat with you a bit during the, the break and oh. such. Um, but no, no, first off, thank you so much to Paul. <laughs>